Okay, so today we are talking about streamlining environmental compliance through program improvements. We're going to our oh, sorry, new computer today. So Jennifer Adams is the newly appointed director of compliance and permitting in the South region. See, now I'm all ner now I'm all nervous. So um, she is, of course, from Texas A&M, and she's done quite a few webinars through the years. I would say you're Four, you're a pro. Months. You're a pro at this. I don't know about that. So. Um, so she has been spent eight years in the ready mix agri cement industry before joining WM. So thanks for coming back again. So we must be doing something right if you're coming back. <laughs> Vanessa is our senior engineer at compliance and permitting in our South region and based in San Antonio. She is not from Texas A&M. She is actually from the University of Detroit Mercy. I didn't know if I knew that. So, and, but you've been, you've done a couple of webinars for us too. I have. So you're kind of a pro as well. All right. She has over 10 years experience of environmental compliance in the, for the industrial sector. And her experience includes program development, imp implementation and management as well as regulatory uh, reporting and permitting. Which brings us to, I'm just going to say Sarah B, because that's what we know is. is that okay? Please do. Okay, Sarah B, she's our staff engineer and compliance permitting in our staff in our South region. And she is from Texas A&M University, Kingsville. Sane, yeah. So are, no you, are, are, you, yeah. Are, you, are you technically Aggies or are you something else? We're Hoggies. Hoggies? I know. All right. Well, um, there's nothing. There's a lot funny about that, but I'm not. Gonna, I'm just going to keep going. So, a wide range of experience in environmental projects, including uh, regulatory research, site inspections, emissions calculations, data evaluations, and report compilation. So, okay. So, new year, new approach. So, Jennifer, you want to kind of? We're kind of doing this webinar. We normally do the first of the year for compliance mm -hmm. tips, but new year new approach so kind of explain what that means well we've we've done a um a reporting tips and tricks pitfalls webinar uh, many years now it's a it's a wonderful uh webinar we, we're going to share a link at the end of this one for you um but we we're thinking about it this year trying to think of how we might take a different approach and we're we wanted to focus on how you get your data, how you get to reporting season and the whole rest of the year. Because as um, you know, as an environmental compliance manager, scientist, whoever you are, um, there is a lot that goes into that reporting that basically spans the whole year. So we wanted to talk about uh, creating a, a, a compliance program to cover that whole, the, the whole, uh, take a more holistic approach to compliance versus just focusing on reporting, as important as reporting is. And again, there's a, a link at the end um, that really goes into good detail on, you know, your air emissions inventory, deadlines, pitfalls, that kind of stuff from last year. It's yeah, a great webinar. And that, it is a great webinar. Mm -hmm. I do remember that, so. Yeah, and as we were pre preparing for this webinar and as we start preparing, uh, you know, and assisting our clients prepare for the reporting season, it seems like every year we get into it and we start asking for records, We, we, we fall into the same traps of, hey, did you did you end up making, you know, creating this spreadsheet to track this? And did you end up doing this to help during the reporting season? Because you, when you're in it, you're thinking about it. When you're thinking like, oh, I, I could really improve this process here. I can really streamline this process if I just did X, Y, Z. But once you get through reporting season, you're like, oh, that's all over, said and done with, mm -hmm. on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. And you don't think about it till reporting season comes around. And you're like, darn it, I after never Christmas. Got, after, yeah. right, I yeah. never got around to doing that thing I wanted to do to help streamline reporting season. And hence why we mm -hmm. thought about this would be a productive. It's TRI program. for me every year. Every mm -hmm. year in June, I feel like I'm an expert. And then that next year, June comes around again. I for, I've already mm -hmm. forgotten everything I, I knew and, about TRI. And as good as that webinar was, there was a lot of information. There's a lot. I to mean, it, 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 we, we crammed a ton of information in that, in that hour, 54 so. minutes or whatever it is. So. <laughs> All right, typical approach. All right, so I, I kind of felt like this picture was somewhat appropriate. If you've inherited an environmental program, if you've started uh, as a new environmental person for a new business, even either way, uh, we tend to take a cobbled approach, uh, cobble spreadsheets and a plan someone did 10 years ago, et cetera, et cetera. So really, um, what we want to talk through today is to how to kind of pull yourself out of that, almost start over and create a more, I'm going to use the word holistic again, <clears throat> program to 
keep your facility, your facilities in compliance and be, go beyond that and build an environmental culture. That's that's our goal. Absolutely. You know, in, in industry and in other I guess in various industries, you have, there's a big push for, you know, what's our safety culture? What's our quality culture? And you see the, there's big pushes. When you're in an area where you have a lot of regulatory applicability, there needs to be, I find it useful to have, you know, a, 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 an environmental culture. You spread the love. Sometimes, oftentimes, the environmental is left up to the single environmental manager or the quality manager wearing the environmental hat or the safety manager wearing the environmental hat. Or we've come across this, the human resource manager. The human resource manager, mm -hmm. exactly, yeah. <laughs> doing quality, safety, and environmental. Yes. And so it, to get, a, you know, to move away from that is establishing an environmental culture of where everybody who has, who touches some sort of process that has or plays into the, some thing that's, you know, applicable to environmental regulations to spread that love, create the more environmental culture, like a holistic, a more holistic approach. So it's mm -hmm. just not a single person responsible for all of the applicable reporting and permitting and compliance. And that builds the ownership. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. All right. All right, just high level, this is, uh, again, we're, our goal is to build that environmental culture. So we're gonna go through these three general areas that kind of narrow down your focus and direct, um, direct you to the tools you need, what applies to your facility, who you can pull in to really, really grow that culture. So these are, this is our, these are our topics. <clears throat> so starting out, I mean, this sounds really, really obvious, but I can't tell you how many times, um, even when I was starting out, you, you just jump right in and you look at the end of a permit or you know you have a stormwater inspection that you have to do, but you haven't actually read the permit. And it's common sense, you would think it's common sense, but I think, you know, we get busy, we get thrown into things, we have a lot of responsibilities. So really, you're, this is where I was talking about earlier, you kind of step back, take yourself out of everything, go back up high level and pull all of your permits and then figure out what regulations are out there that should apply to your facility that you might not have applied yet. Because as we know, there's stacks and stacks and stacks of regulations. Um, and one of the, uh, we're, you know, we assume that there are files, I've, but I've walked into environmental offices where there are, you know, random files, there's some crinkled up paper in a binder from 10 years ago, there's no copy of Kerm current permit, I almost said Kermit. Um, so it's important to also know where to find those permits. And this is just, this is literally just step one. Uh, and uh, knowing, you know, your resources, TCQ, EPA, um, historic colleague, the plant managers. A lot of times a plant manager knows where this file was filed at one time. And then uh, Vanessa, you were talking earlier about building yeah. a crosswalk once you've done, taken that step. Absolutely. So, so again, sometimes you have documents everywhere. First is just compiling everything, putting them in one big stack and putting those on the shelf and say, okay, here's, here's everything I have. Then if it just seems overwhelming and daunting to start to tackle everything, Start small. Start with a you know a permit that has permit conditions. List those out. Put those in a spreadsheet or in a word table and list each of those conditions out. I mean, copy and paste that and say, okay, focus. It, it'll, for me, it helps focus me. Look at that condition and say, okay, how do we how do we comply with this particular permit condition? If it is uh, maintenance, if it says you know you need to maintain this equipment on an annual basis, your note next to that would say maintenance maintains this on an annual basis. Okay, well, where's that record kept? Then you go and trace down, go ask maintenance. Hey, do y'all keep these certain records? Yes, okay, where is that kept? That's kept in the maintenance office in the binder. Or that's in our work order system. And you just create that compliance crosswalk going from, from the very first condition to the very last condition. And it, that way it really helps you understand what are the conditions, what are the emission limitations? What are the operating limitations? What are some of the record keeping? What is the reporting? And then who all is able and who all has, who is the resource that can provide you this information? So it's not a fire drill during reporting season or during an inspection, especially during an inspection. An inspector comes in, they sit down and say, hey, show me your X, Y, Z. If, if you're out there running around trying to go and pull, trying to ask around, hey, who has this? Who's this? I thought y'all were in charge of this. It, it, the, the the old adage of uh, idle hands are devil's playground. I mean, an inspector is going to be like, well, 
what else what else what else is broken here yeah exactly exactly Mm -hmm. they're They're gonna gonna write you up for a lot more if you don't have your paperwork in order absolutely Mm -hmm. versus if you have everything in this one central i mean it doesn't have to be one central file but if you have a comprehensive document that says oh yeah and that's here let me go get that for you and then come back or at least a map uh, exactly. and, that's, and that's what it is a treasure map and i that, think that's over it. but and that's what it is it's a treasure map because you, it as much as you want to have everything housed in one area when you have all these other players like uh paint logs or engine logs or you know work orders from from maintenance activities that's just you know mm. the it's not realistic that it's all going to be in one central location, but you can know where that's at and ha- and have that written down. And as things change, if somebody comes and says, oh, we updated our work order system, now it's included with some other enterprise-wide software, you update and you change it. And again, if you ever have that need or that need comes up, you can say, oh, yeah, it's this and this. It's right here. Go pull that. And you're able to re- retrieve that fairly quickly because one of the conditions is to have documents readily available. I mean, mm-hmm. that's a ca- that is in every mm-hmm. – it's permit. every yes. air permit, I mean, waste, permit, and every regulation, you have to have your permits readily available. Okay, I have a question. And if we're going to get into it later, just say we'll get to it later. So if you have a, a certain permit, let's just say a certain air permit, and there's some changes in that permit, okay, does the, in this case, it would be the TCQ, and in some of the other states, it might be the EPA or the state's regu- regulatory s- system. Do, do they will they notify the them and say there will be a change in your permit or, or you're going to need to do a separate permit or is it just like because I'm sure permits change from time to time yes no absolutely uh, generally it's an overarching notification to industry everybody mm-hmm. so when there's a change coming so that HR manager doesn't isn't on the notification list that could be more, problematic too more it's not so much that you're going to be notified of a change. It's you need to notify of a change. If you have an operational change or a process change or new equipment or, um, you know, increase in, you know, throughput, when there is a change other than what was represented in your initial permit application or subsequent revisions, you need to notify the agency of those changes. Um, Well, first you need to make a determination of does this impact and then yes. And then, Typically, that requires a, a revision. So you don't get notified that because they don't they don't know that if you know you're operating, they don't know that you've made a change until or unless you're you're on you know the inspection roll call, right? They do an inspection and you're walking them through, and all of a sudden they say, "Oh, well, here in your permit it says you have three boilers, but you're operating six boilers." <laughs> Would you put that as one of your tasks on this crosswalk to go and check? That you're still doing the same thing you did, you know, 10 years ago when you got it? You can, you can, or as you start to build this environmental culture, this environmental awareness, people now, you know, will hopefully know to, hey, we're thinking about doing this new, you know, this, this new line. Let's go run it by the environmental person and say, is this going to impact our, any permit conditions or can we even do this? Are Mm -hmm. we in a zone that, you know, that that allows that kind of that kind of new source or pollutant that's going to come from that source. So, so yes, that is one way to do it, but it's also, again, on the onus of everybody to have an awareness and an understanding of this is what triggers certain various uh, programs, Mm -hmm. environmental programs. So the, so the permits definitely necessarily don't change, but your usage for it, a different permit may. Mm-hmm. It, it will ch- it will change. It yeah. will trigger a change, correct? Yeah, okay. Yeah. And when you talk about high-level regulation changes, that is not something that you uh, an industry generally gets a an individual notification. That's where continually tracking the regulations that apply to you will help keep you aware of changes coming down the line. And that's tough. That's tough mm-hmm. to do when, tough. again, you're you're a single source at a site wearing mm-hmm. multiple hats. I mean, even if you're the sole environmental person, that's tough to do because there's mm-hmm. so many changes happening on in the back in the background. What I found when I was in industry and still that I, you know, that I find useful now is those compliance alerts. Mm -hmm. It is a subscription service, but there it's this nice little like newsletter type thing that you comes weekly or yeah, yeah, weekly or daily. daily. Yeah. And and you get these alerts, you you see what's happening, you see what's coming down the pipeline, you see what's, you know, um, Mm -hmm. on the docket, what's getting, uh, what's being open for comment, uh, what's about to be finalized, what's in draft form. And then also you have, there's like a little section that talks about uh, here are the offenders <laughs> that make the, you know, honorable mm-hmm. mentions of these are the offenders. So you see where, where the agency's focusing their efforts. And the fines. I know and that the I've fines. Seen fines. That. Exactly. Yeah. Those are big. Mm-hmm. And that's something that you would just 
register for with TCEQ? No, it's a, it's a service. It's called Compliance. I think Alert. it's called Compliance. Alert. Alert. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, but, oh, go ahead. I was going to say on top of that, because that's a great daily or weekly, however you subscribe alert or a reminder. Um, any industry trade groups, they usually have an environmental committee. Um, that's where you can, especially if you're a sole operator, that's where you can get around your peers and really discuss. Uh, and they usually share changes coming down the line. Uh, just get around. It, it kind of creates your additional environmental team in a way uh, to have those additional, those people that do the same thing you do to talk through changes that might be coming. Just another tool. And and your regulatory agencies typically have, you can sign up for yeah. Uh, for notification. So we know, I know TCQ has, has them, EPA has them. I know. Um, so California if there's somebody new them. out there that's new to, to in, in that role and they're like, ah, so there's places you can go to make sure that you are getting those notifications. Right. But you do have to seek those out. You yeah. definitely mm -hmm. have to go and search for those to, and, and sign up for those. Even at TCQ, there's like several different There's a bunch. bunch that you have to like click through and say, yes, this is applicable to me. And I want to learn about this in the event something comes out. And just so for everybody that's because we're now going nationwide with these, the TCQ is um, Texas version of the EPA. Is that mm -hmm. fair? It's so fair. it's the state agency. Yeah. State, state agency. agency. So there you go. All right. Hey, I'll wing it sometimes. So what are you going <laughs> to say? What are you going to do? I like it. Uh, so I wanted to circle back to the kind of the beginning on this one, just to reiterate how important that crosswalk is that Vanessa was talking about or however it is that you, however method you take to distill all those different conditions and kind of take them out of the permit and put them in front of you and know when, where, what, why, how, all that. And then to add on to that, um, you know, we're talking about being aware and so, sole operators. Uh, even if you're not a sole operator, one, a really good way to kind of take a step back and start over is with an audit, um, internal or external. Uh, get fresh eyes on your operation, bring in some people that uh, are potentially experts on all the different rules that may apply, and get a report that shows what you may be missing, what actually applies, what doesn't. It's, it's, a, it's a good tool to use for this high-level step-back refresh. And even if you have an established program, even, you know, when we get to, sure. you know, we get everything papered and everything established, you, it's, it's, it's not self, it's not a one and done mm -mm. things. Are, again, things are always changing. Sometimes something in your process changes. Sometimes something in your operations changes that you're not aware of. And when you just a fresh set of eyes, you know, you, they, they find something and you're mm -hmm. like, Oh, I, I completely forgot about that. Or it just kind of fell off your radar. It was so, it was kind of low hanging fruit that you always thought of, Oh, that's low hanging fruit. Let me, let me tackle the bigger things. And it just never got taken mm -hmm. care of. And so it's, it's, it's not a one and done audits. Occasional audits are always super, super helpful. And if you're part of a larger um, organization that has multiple sites, teaming up with some of your, you know, companion sites and y'all doing like internal type audits, like auditing each other's mm -hmm. a peer audits, auditing each other's sites to, you know, again, just a fresh set of eyes. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, you know, this is what's different here. Why are we not doing it there? Right. And then you, you just learn things. You learn you things. Do. I, I know uh, when I was in industry, I was responsible for about 50 small sites, small ready mix sites. And I, w I would swear I had been, I could have gone to a site Wednesday of last week and go again today. And there's something else out there that's happening. That's weird. That's funky. That needs to be addressed. It, it doesn't matter how many times you go. There is always something changing. Absolutely. So that's very true. All right. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> there we go. Lance has a new computer. I do. <laughs> and it was working two seconds ago hitting that button, and now it doesn't. So, all right, here's a uh, here's a, a jumble of words. It is a jumble of words, and I think it, the jumble of words really highlights the jumble of reports and inspections. I don't see holistic in there, though. Oh, just I kidding. know. I should put that in there. Just kidding. <laughs> So we're trying to distill, use all these words, distill this jumble of words to a holistic approach to uh, environmental, creating an environmental culture. There you go. Nice. Um, so back to this. We have done our um, crosswalk. We've identified all of our requirements. So we have all these things. We have monthly, weekly, annual, quarterly inspections. Uh, we have to, we realize, oh, we produce X hazardous waste, so we must track these manifest. And then that triggers this other reporting um, okay, we have a stormwater outfall, so I have to develop a SWIP, and then I have to do quarterly stormwater monitoring, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the next step here is really 
figuring out uh, how to attack each one of these things after we've created our uh, crosswalk and uh, realized what all reports we have. we have. Sorry, Lance is dropping things over here. So here we have to generate this output list. We've yes. got all the things that we have to do. Now we have action items that we need to make from it, right? Mm -hmm. Action items is a good, it's a good way to put it. What are these things do? What is our, we got to create an inspection cadence, uh, create a, uh, figure out which monitoring, because a lot uh, on, in bigger facilities, when you have air monitoring, you have to have special equipment, you have to prove that that equipment is working. It's it's a lot, it's a jumble of words, basically. That equipment has to be calibrated. calibrated. That, I mean, there, there's mm -hmm. a whole lot of requirements that are in just that single Mm -hmm. make up there's more requirements to make up that single requirement right and then this is where you start pulling in your other departments for a tier two or a tri uh, that's where purchasing can, can come in where maintenance records so that could be air uh, that could be stormwater it could be spcc how many for tri obviously it's purchasing what was uh how much of x chemical processed through the facility that year and then um of course your air monitoring your calibrations, in a way summary. Okay, so you have to kind of identify the people that you're gonna be reaching out to in each mm -hmm. department and getting your secondary environmental players, right? Yes, this is where you pull, you create your team, your kind of environmental village, I guess we could call it. Mm -hmm. it yeah, so it seems like step one was the audit. Step one was the gathering phase. What all is applicable? What what what, what plans do we currently have? What rules are applicable to us? How, which permits do we have? And right now, what I guess what this jumble represents is now it's a jumble. Now it's a lot of information. And mm -hmm. how do we go about t attacking, tackling this in a systematic, organized type right. of way? Right. So these are some high-level questions that come out of this jumble, I think. Um, so who who's available? We sort of hit on that a little bit earlier. Um, what tools do you already have? Uh, obviously, there's a bunch of software out there. If you work in any sort of larger manufacturing company, you've probably gotten lots of emails and calls. Let me come sell you the software. Uh, but really, we just kind of wanted to go through the thought process on developing your program. So that starts with branching out of your environmental department. So who who is there? Who who does what? You have your operators who are right there working with the equipment that's permitted. They they do the maintenance. They they um they are in charge of the operations, which is the point, right, of having a manufacturing facility. It's not the environmental department, it's your operations. So it's it's identifying based on your requirements and what reports you have, who can help provide the data during the year so you have um, a repository of everything you need and you're not scrambling every March or every June. And that's a chance to get people to buy into this environmental culture and have this ownership of it all. Mm -hmm. So there's always the people in any team that kind of want more who are leaders who like to share what they know. So you can bring them in, teach them about your program and have them kind of be your boots on the ground and teach others and spread the culture. That's absolutely right. I know, I mean, go back to having 50 ready mix plants. There's no way I'm going to go out there as one person across Texas and do all their stormwater inspections because we had monthly inspections, do all their SPCC inspections. It, it involved a lot of thought process training, go out there and train multiple operators and help them understand. I always used to do training and tell them to put on their environmental glasses, like kind of putting, putting on your rose colored glasses and to go out there and, uh, we would do a mock inspection, a mock environmental inspection, and they would, they really would kind of put that hat on and come back and we talk about it and they would, they would see what I would normally see versus seeing the operation side. They saw the environmental side and that absolutely creates that ownership and creates that many more people who will notify you when you have, when you create that change, you, you make that change that triggers an air permit. Did they have ideas about what can be changed to do it better? Absolutely. That's another huge plus because again, they, and that's a byproduct yeah. of this whole environmental culture yes. is we can't sit here and possibly think uh, that I can improve a process that I'm not operating on a daily basis mm -hmm. or that I'm looking at on a daily basis or, you know, the, the SMEs, the subject matter experts, they are the ones that, I mean, they, they do this day in and day out and they, I got <laughs> me being an SME in my own I can see things that happen. It's like, man, if I could just improve this process, if I could just do this a little bit differently, it would be that much more efficient. 
all SMEs are like that. All SMEs think of the w ways, it, you know, of efficiency. And so if you go to them and say, hey, we have this issue and they start to have that ownership in it, they're going to be like, you know what, I've seen this as well. I was thinking, or I have an idea, or here's what we can do with little, you know, not like a huge hurt of capital or labor and, and a whole bunch of change. I mean, there's little changes you can make. And the more you, the more ownership they have, the more they're willing to provide that feedback and provide that information. The print shop that we're working on the air permit mm -hmm. up in Dallas, we talked to them. We found out their solvent usage didn't have to be what it was. They made some small changes mm -hmm. and just millions of dollars in control equipment they don't ever have to buy. Right. And so, and, and how, so how do we get there? How do we get to that point? Um, as part of SPCC and stormwater, you have to do environment, uh, you know, stormwater or environmental awareness, right? So instead of, again, this is all about not, we're not making these huge sweeping changes because that just never, <laughs> never works. <laughs> Take it a piecemeal approach, right? So it is part of the existing training that you have, the environmental awareness training that you, most of us have to have start to put in a little bit more information. Right now, we keep it really high level. Let's put in just enough information to meet our requirement and not put whoever's at this, attending this training to sleep. Well, let's start to make it a little bit more beefy. Let's start to make it a little bit more applicable to, to what they do. And so I, I could think of painting, for example. If you have a paint booth, if you do painting at your, at your operations or at your facility, you know, talk about a little bit what how that impacts your air permit, how that what what you have to look for, what records you have to keep. And so that way, when you go to them and say, hey, I need X, Y, Z, they know why you're asking for that. You're just, you're just, you know, knowledge goes a long way mm -hmm. and people want to generally be helpful. I mean, there are, I mean, there are exceptions, but that, that's how you start to build that awareness, that, that, that ownership, that environment, that environmental culture. And I think about, you know, who can help. I was around TRI, tier two emissions inventory reporting. A lot of time, a lot of the resources that we need as we're preparing these reports are purchasing records, right? And there's always this big push on March 15th to start getting, for I guess emissions inventory, to start to start gathering those records. And the first person we go to is our purchaser, and they, that you know, that's the middle of the month. They're starting to get their numbers for. It's always it's always a hassle. So as part of you know the who can help spreading the love, developing your program, inform. As part of the awareness, inform them like this is what I this is what I have to do. And how about instead of me coming to you once a year, how about you provide this to me on a monthly basis? I'll come to you and ask for it. And then as 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 the time goes on, they start to have an understanding of what you're looking for. And so that way, when the, we start to buy a different kind of solvent or degreaser, they'll now have an awareness of like, hey, I remember you asked for this. By the way, we decided to go with this other company. It's a little bit more cost effective, but it is, you know, it's a different formulation. And so here's what it is. So now, now what that does is you now know you got a different product. You now know you need to go find that SDS. How does it impact either your air permit? How does it impact if it's generating a waste? How does it impact your waste generation? From a safety standpoint, you have to have those SDSs on hand at all times. Um, and, and for reporting for TRI, tier two, potentially, if you're mm -hmm. buying it in enough quantities at one time. So it starts to build again that, and you're, you're not that crazy person running around <laughs> at the beginning of the year, every year saying, where's this, where's that? And oh my gosh, we have all these new products. Nobody told me we had these new products. Mm -hmm. Now it makes it a little bit more digestible. Right. And you have, and you have other people in the boat with you. So you're creating, you're establishing those procedures. You're pulling in your additional team outside environmental and that stream, that help that streamlining of your reporting season really helps to, uh, it really allows you to focus on your day-to-day -day compliance, mm -hmm. bigger picture mm -hmm. through the entire year. Mm -hmm. Because I think we all know, I think I said this earlier, your that annual reporting, it's, a sm it's really a small portion of what we do as compliance professionals all year. And that is a lot of time and effort. That scrambles a lot of time and effort that could be spent much uh, in, in a much better way, keeping your facility in compliance overall compliance. And you're not that chicken little, right? <laughs> and you're not, and you're not stressing out. And the people that you need the information from are not stressing out because you're, it's just unrealistic to, for anyone to think that that environmental person is going to have all that information ready mm -hmm. to go put, you know, push go button and you're done. I just, right. <laughs> and, I mean, if you do have that, that is awesome. That's amazing. Kudos to you. Mm -hmm. In it, my experience, it just, that's and if you get this, case. if you get the right program in, it probably means less stress next year when you're going Absolutely. through reporting. Mm -hmm. It's a Absolutely. lot. It's just, you know what? Hey, we should have been doing this a long time ago.
Yes. I wish we would have done that. It's time just ago. that it's like everything we uh, to pull uh, Sarah into this. It's like everything we start over in the new year. It's a little cheesy, new year, new you, but it, it's kind of that time to take a step back and reevaluate the maybe bad habits mm-hmm. that you've gotten in. Uh, scrambling every year because you just didn't have time the rest of the year mm-hmm. to do to establish that procedure, write that SOP. Uh, it really th- this kind of step back holistic approach, I think, really, really helps this time of year. And it, and it's a back to basics. So uh, mm-hmm. we've talked about a little of identifying and where can we find that. Another thing, especially for those programs that are those reporting, those reports that you are only done once a year, it's it's as you're going through this program development, say, what is the requirement? Write that down on, I mean, on a spreadsheet, you can have a, this can all be done on a single spreadsheet. I mean, Mm -hmm. the bigger facility you are, it's going to be more massive. And then you eventually want to go into more documentation mode. But from the beginning, just a a scratch sheet of of a spreadsheet that has tabs for each different media and write down, what is the requirements? Why is this applicable to me? Write down your NACS code or SIG code or whatever makes you applicable. And then some resources that you came across. I know I'm one of my bad habits is I, I go to the same resources, but I forget to bookmark them or I forget mm-hmm. to put them in my cheat sheet and I'm there Googling, where's that? I know there's that resource. I know I saw that on something, Put link them, link those documents. So this is where I have this mm-hmm. embed that link and then have all your information. Here's who I spoke to last time that helped me with this. And then again, build, start to build in those, those little efficiencies little mm-hmm. by little. So if somebody's out there, and they're listening to this and they're going, this sounds awesome. Sounds great. I don't, but where do I start? I mean, what's the, is there one, I mean, tip that you can say, at least start with this. Right now that we're in reporting season, I would say start with the most, what's coming up. What's coming up. So right now what's coming up? Tier, tier two. two. Tier two. Mm-hmm. Start with tier two. Okay. And if you have an, uh, an air emissions inventory, I'd start there start now there. too. Yeah. <laughs> so you, don't you, wait. <laughs> see, my eyes already crossed. Oh, oh boy. <laughs> I mean, a- annual waste summary is coming up too. It I mean, is? You, it, yeah. it, again, it's reporting. I mean, everything's coming know. up. I mean, come on. Up. Yeah. But I would say I would st- start with tier two. Okay. Just, mm-hmm. that, that's a once a year thing. It's one of those that it's kind of, it's in the, it's on, it's in the back burner until it's not, until mm-hmm. it's reporting season. And that's one of the, that's one of the fire drill one. So, and that's one that really, once you have it established, it's, that is a little bit more cruise control. Like it really once, is. Once yeah. you, est- once you build your spreadsheet, here are all the products have your the, the relationship with your purchasing people, with your with your inventory people, um, and once you have that established, that that one is really a a uh, cruise control type of. Thing. So when you go, so I'm sure that you get calls and say, "Hey, I need it's reporting season. I need help coming up soon." Well, I mean, is there is there something a common theme that you can see in in every facility, or, or like just is it just mis or uh, unorganized or is there something that you can that you see common everywhere that's like hey, it's just probably knowing what you don't know is probably important. The amount of what I've seen is the amount of double work. So we'll the 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 environmental person will call or safety or whatever their role is will call and say, you know, I need help with my tier two. I don't know, I, I you know what what do we need? And so we'll provide them a data needs list. And so here they are starting from scratch this data needs list. So then you know we're asking more questions about some of the that material. So they go and ask another person and they're like, oh yeah, yeah, we have all this. And then they the, somebody's already been keeping some f- f- sort of record in some form that may not be exactly what we need, but it's very similar. And then we just expand on that and we take that and 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 expand on it. So it's it's again minimizing duplicate efforts. So I think that's one of the most common things that I mm-hmm. see is that that information is there and it's already done. We're not starting from scratch, but it's the person maybe not knowing that somebody else is already doing it. Gotcha. I agree. Yeah. Uh, to go back to kind of cycle, circle back to tools and who can help. So, you know, we, we've talked through again, pulling in everybody, establishing your procedures. And I know this takes a lot of time. This will take a chunk of time, but then your uh, reporting and everything else should move, run a lot smoother after that. So what, some of the things that we have seen, so Vanessa was talking about compiling everything into a spreadsheet. And I've seen this even at large facilities, mm-hmm. all their air permit requirements, why uh, the links to the websites, like she was saying, uh, compiling all that and then setting, using, your, using that Outlook calendar to mm-hmm. set your reminders every quarter, every half of the year, every month to go Check and see if you've done this report, if you've done this inspection, make yourself a checklist, uh, check, uh, I would set a reminder or use, you know, the compliance alerts or the regulatory agency alerts uh, to track 
uh, to, to go back and take a high level audit of your regulations. Um, but that way, I mean, we talk about tools that can be purchased, and uh, I, I think having that spreadsheet, taking that extra effort to already know what applies to you and what you need to be tracking, when it comes time when you get big enough, when it comes time to actually entertain one of those calls from a software company, you are in a much better place to know what to ask for because Absolutely. they're just so, Absolutely. there's so many choices. Even if you decide to go the software approach and you don't already have some kind of notebook or some kind of system, it's the implementation, the transition is going to be so much more painful and more expensive because mm -hmm. you're going to need their help to help do that. But if you already have some rough version of it, it makes that implementation and transition so much more easier. And you know what you need. And you know what you're you not need. buying a, a module Absolutely. that doesn't apply to you or a module that you realize, oh, I'm doing this just fine with my spreadsheet. Absolutely. I actually don't need this software, but I do need it to track all these million air permit requirements that I have. I don't need it for tier two, that kind of thing. So yep. it's that I, back to the beginning of the year, it's annoying, but getting organized, getting your environmental compliance program organized, and then um, expanding it out to your team. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So do you guys get a, a lot of people call and say, hey, I'm new to I'm new to this position and I don't I'm, I need help. I just I Absolutely. don't know where to go. So so. And, and people get nervous when they hear the, the two buzzwords um, audits and mm -hmm. what's the other I. Uh, um, so oh, it was just right there. On Inspection. My... Inspections. Yeah. They get nervous when they hear, when they get that. So, oh, right. you know, so is there something that, you know, we can, kind of, you know, I know that, I don't, I don't know if this is, uh, but we used to do a RAS, a regulatory mm -hmm. assessment survey. Regulatory applicability screen. screen. Mm -hmm. Is it, was that? That's, is that takes the here, audit or? word out of it for sure. Uh, it's really, it's literally, it's kind of like the, um, it's sort of like the crosswalk Vanessa was talking about about where you go through the regulations and you pick out, you do a tour, you pick out which may apply to your site. You're not judging. It's not a deep oh, dive. Though. Yeah, it's not a deep dive. Oh, you didn't do this little, you didn't check this box on your SPCC inspection. It's, oh, you need an SPCC because you have X, Y, Z. And obviously they get more complicated than that, but that's just an example. Yeah, okay. Because yeah. audit is a scary word. It really is. But there is definitely that option, especially when it's not just you you being the new person, but when a company goes through either an acquisition oh, and a purge, or, I mean, you have high turnover, you absolutely are going to, you know, there's not going to be a whole lot of options for you to go and ask people that may have that tribal knowledge. If yeah. you, it's been through that kind of situation. You, you, Rather, are, are, you can't help. Also, just going through and clicking through your your, your company server, go through yeah. the files because they, sometimes they're they're buried in there. That's what mm -hmm. I would say. Step one is go looking through files. Step two, go ask you know who's been there the longest. They can typically point you in that direction. And then if they, if no one truly knows, you know, you better get some help. Right, get, get, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, seek out help, and a RAS may be an option. Or okay. if you feel like there's something that's yeah, like, it's a, egregious, like yeah. okay, you know, y'all, you know had a permit at one point, it lasts, but you're still operating all that same equipment without a permit, then don't get a RAS. Call and say, I I think there's something wrong. I don't know quite what it is. And then we'll get you in the audit program because mm -hmm. the audit privilege program. Audit privilege yeah. program. Because that'll help shield you from mm -hmm. you just can't know what's wrong before you go into it. Yeah, so like a checkup. <laughs> you gotta go in and get your checkup. So mm -hmm. okay. Done with this one? My button's not working all of a sudden. I don't like that. No, that button's not working. There we go. So once again, this is the link. And Lance, Lance sends the slides out. Uh, so there should be, you should be able to click this link. If not, you can search it on our website. Um, this is last year's more of a deep dive into the details of reporting. It goes into emissions inventories, tier two, um, annual waste summary, I believe. And then we have a later one. I didn't link this one, but we do have a later one in the year for TRI. Yeah, so if you go to our website, if you can't, if it, we think that the link is going to be on the slides, it, but it's a PDF form. So if you can't, go to our website in our, in our search field, type in uh, reporting deadlines, and it will come up. It'll actually have the webinar and the slides that you can look at. You can download. Okay. You can download, yes. Okay, so I do have a couple of questions. One of the questions that I have from our audience is, is it, and we might have already answered this, but is it common? Is it common to know what permits you need? Is it okay? Sorry, is it common not? To, is it common to not know what permits you need? Definitely. Well, you just 
So yeah. you were asking about, uh, you know, we get calls, help me with reporting, same thing. Uh, you know, if you get, we all know environmental regulations. If you threw me into a safety job, I would be calling because I would have no idea what to do. And we see the kind of the opposite a lot where you have someone who knows everything about safety and they've now acquired the environmental side of the business. So they're, they shouldn't be expected to know what permit they have. But, and then also you get thrown in a job. When I was new, I didn't have anyone telling me, you know what, you really should read your permit. Uh, so it's it's not a, it's more common than you would think to Agreed. just because you you jump right into the details and the doing and you don't go back to the beginning and even read the regs sometimes when you're new. But yeah, I think it, it it it's more common than not to not know you need a permit, especially when you've inherited something and 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 it and they're like oh we have this great program it's it's a well oiled machine, and then you know you do a site walk and you're like oh. When did we get this? Oh, we just got that. That was part of the expansion that happened last year. And then all of a sudden you're like, oh, well, does that need to be permitted? <laughs> I mean, so yeah, so that happens more often than not. And um, so, and I, I just know that because I, I, I hear some of the phone calls, try not to to wait too long to call for help because a lot of times it's like, oh yeah, my reports are due tomorrow and I need help. There's, or TCQ just inspected me. I need help. You don't yeah, want that. Yeah. Well, we, I mean, we get that all the time, every day, so. It's our bread and butter, I think. <laughs> Vanessa, do you, you had a question too? I've got one right here. What if you realize after the fact that you made a mistake on your report? If you've made a mistake and it's a, you know, small, you know, you may have, may have used a wrong, you know, multiplier factor or, wrong, a, you know, a, a, you linked something inaccurately. If it's small change, just revise it and send in to the agency, you know, the, the revised version cover letter. Hey, you know, be, being honest, you know, this is regarding for reporting year, yada, 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 some changes, you know, there was a miscalculation, some changes were made, here is the the new version. Typically, that's not going to create any, mm -hmm. any, any hubbub. Now, if as par part of the, you know, your reporting, you submitted it, and then, you know, somebody else said something, and it's like, you're missing a big chunk of it, and you're like, oh, well, did we do that last year? No, we didn't put that, we didn't report that last year. Did you report that year? Prior? No. So if you, it's a little more egregious. If it's a little more, I mean, systemic issue, then I would say stop and call and we'll get you uh, as part of the, the, the audit, of, privilege. The audit, audit mm -hmm. privilege program. As long as you're not aware, fully aware of all the details before and so don't do an audit and then try to come back and do an audit, right. or audit privilege. Mm -hmm. You cannot know what's wrong. You cannot know the details of what's wrong and still be protected under auto privilege. You can if, have an idea. You can have, you can have a, a, an, an inkling, an inkling <laughs> some yeah. understanding like, oh, mm -hmm. maybe this isn't exactly right. And maybe you know, under reporting for the last 10 years. Yeah. <laughs> if, uh, if it's a big issue, it's a, if it's a big error, like on TRI, for example, and you catch it and you know the details, I think going back to what Vanessa said, absolutely being upfront, honest with the agency, even the EPA is the best thing you can do. Absolutely. They appreciate that. Even if it does result in a fine because of the way the rule is written, it's much better to self-report that issue than to have the agency find it. Absolutely. Um, and if it's TRI here in region six, Mr. Wakeland will find it. Mr. Wakeland <laughs> will find it. Yes, he, he will. will find it. Mm -hmm. What happens if you miss a deadline? Same thing. Same thing, really, yeah. yeah. Okay. Report. For, I would say if you missed a deadline, notify the agency, say, we just realized we missed a deadline. We are getting that prepared right now. We will have that and have some timeline, have some corrective mm -hmm. action ready and waiting. Um, and then sometimes when you do the submittal, if you wanted to go the you know whole root cause analysis type thing, you can even say, we have now created a calendar for us to remind, to be mm -hmm. reminded, be proactive because if it, it does result in a violation, they're going to ask you for that question. It's going to be an administrative mm -hmm. violation. They're going to say, okay, well, how are you, how are you going to pre prevent, you know, prevent this, you know, going mm -hmm. forward? So if you, if you're up front on the front end, it usually takes care of itself. Excellent. And uh, we did have a, a rather lengthy question, uh, Mr. Uh, Peter Thompson, but I'm going to, I'm going to send that to you guys and, and you will answer him with it and mm -hmm. respond in an email because there's, there's like, there's a couple different questions in there. So Perfect. Uh, we will get that to you. So, Okay, so um, that's it, guys. You did. You made it through. Congratulations, yeah. first one of the year. See, wasn't that bad, was it, Sarah? 
<laughs> so um, just wanted to tell you guys a little bit about Braun Intertech. Uh, about a year and a half ago, not quite a year and a half ago, we were uh, WM was acquired by Braun and Braun Intertech is a self uh, is an employee owned firm uh, operating out of uh, mainly it was the mid. West. I always I, I want to make sure that I that I say that right. It's mainly the Midwest, and they've been operating in Texas for a couple of years. And we were required to to really be a part of their um, environmental arm of the company. But they um, Braun does more geotech um, construction, geo materials, construction materials testing, geosciences examination, examinations. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we just wanted to make sure that we. Um, we spread that because a lot of people don't know. So if you guys have any other questions uh, after this webinar, uh, this is Jennifer's contact information. Um, and uh, so give her a call or email. She'll probably send it to me. I'm just kidding. But uh, uh, yeah, so we'd be happy to answer your questions or more importantly, help you out with your facilities, um, environmental compliance needs for sure. So. So our next webinar is uh, Remediation Regulation of PFAS, and Andy Adams and Mark Keffer, Kiefer, I think it's Kiefer, sorry, I, if I said you're, it's, it's Kiefer. Um, we're going to be talking that on uh, February 27th, and so do you guys know anything about PFAS? Because all of a sudden, I, I didn't really know anything about PFAS, now it's like everywhere, so... So by the blank looks on their face, they need to be in this webinar as well. So it's uh, so I guess we'll all learn something a little bit about PFAS. But I know that it has um, it's the firefighting foam and the primary ingredient and, and yeah, yeah so non -stick. that's all I know. Yeah, and that's not so so. <laughs> thank you guys so much for a great webinar. You did good. Everybody did so well. I mean, it's a little nerve wracking at the end, but I think you guys did an amazing job. So, and Vanessa, you'll be back next month. No, oh, not, no, oh, sorry, March. March. You won't be doing PFOS. Thank goodness, because we didn't know Thanks what it was. So. Nudge. Nudge. <laughs> All right. Sorry, Lydia. Thank you guys so much, and uh, we'll look forward to your questions. Have a great one. Bye bye.